Hello, everyone. Welcome to one more Meet, in, meet Over Lunch series. Uh, today, we're, our topic is, well, our table is called The Fine Line. Uh, it's a conversation between Sharon Polia Kine and Cecilia Abage. And I'll be mediating the talk. My name is Gabriela Davies. We're all current residents at RU. Uh, both of them are artists while I'm a curator in residence. And um, we'll be discussing about what it's like to enter the art world, to become an artist, to explore practices, to explore crafts, and mainly to understand whether there is a line, whether there is a division, or um, if, there is, if there is a need to have a division between design, art, craft, and being an artist, being a designer, being a craftsperson. Um, so first and foremost, I would like to introduce both, both artists. They will show a brief presentation about their works. Um, so we can kind of have a, their, their works and their trajectory actually. So like we're gonna have uh, uh, an overview of what, what, what they've been doing, like what their, their, their understanding of their practice is. Um, and then we'll actually open up a debate to understand a bit more openly, or at least to, to explore about this, um, this matter, which has always been in, in question throughout art history. Um, so first and foremost, I will invite Cecilia to speak first, then uh, Sharon will, will come second uh, in their presentations, but we're all, it, it's not in a matter of of uh, importance, much on the contrary, it's just random, maybe even alphabetical. And there are other reasons Sharon said, which I disagree, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> so I won't just state them. So it's, it's up to your curiosity to think about that. Um, so Cecilia Beige is currently a uh, design, well, she, she, she's currently living in New York, but she's originally Brazilian from Rio de Janeiro. She's an artist and a designer. And she has studied at PUC-Rio, graphic design, for her bachelor's degree. She has worked um, in Farmi, which is a, a very big uh, fashion brand, which is very well known for, for their uh, patterns and like their, their very um, colorful clothes. And uh, she has been currently working as well as a designer. Um, Sorry, sis, I didn't really know down the name of the company. No, no worries. Um, at um, a startup called Emilio, it's um, here in the U.S. Um, yeah, maybe maybe I, I should um, present, I don't know. Uh, well, I'll let you do it once you do the, the presentations. Okay. But just, just to uh, finish off a bit of your introduction, so then we can start opening up the, the, the more in-depth knowledge of both you and Sharon. Um, your, well, her practice is also uh, really based on ceramics, uh, printmaking, illustration, and aspects of, of design and graphic design in general, even within her arts, even when she's making uh, pieces of considered um, artwork. As for, for Sharon, uh, she is uh, from Tel Aviv, Israel. She will be back. <laughs> she will be back. Um, back. <laughs> oh, am I unstable? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, now we can, we can. It just paused for a while. Crap, okay. For a while, no, for a few seconds. <laughs> okay, so I'll rewind a little bit. So uh, Sharon is from Tel Aviv, Israel, and she uh, has a background in graphic design and printmaking. And for the past 30 years, or at least three decades, she has been working as well as a painter. And her, her practices spans both, both printmaking and painting and drawing as well. So there's also like many big elements of design which, which, which can be seen in her practice. Yeah. Um, and I think this will be a very uh, interesting conversation given that both, both artists come from this background of design 
and they are they introduce themselves to to an artistic field. Um, whether more recently with Cecilia, with a, a, a um, she is understanding herself recently as an artist. Um, for a, a few couple of years, and Sharon has a longer trajectory of, of well, three decades. So I think there is a very interesting debate uh, around the topic of, once again, where design stands within the practice. And I think a lot of it depends also on the craftsmanship design offers. Um, and I would like to, uh, well, actually, and I, and I will introduce myself. My name is Gabriela Davis. I'm also from Brazil, Rio de Janeiro. And uh, I am currently, uh, I'm, I'm currently in New York for the residency, but I'm still valued. Um, I, I'm still based in, in Brazil. And um, I work as a curator and I was the director for Galeria Aimoré, a space in, in Rio de Janeiro. So without further ado, I will invite uh, Cecilia to present her work uh, and then we'll lead on to Sharon. Hey, hello everyone. <laughs> um, I'll share my screen. Really quickly. Doo -doo. Sorry. Let me know if you can all see this. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I just put together a couple of images just to um, show a bit of the tra trajectory and a lot of process. Um, so hi, I'm Cecilia from Rio. Um, I like to give visuals since I'm a very visual person. I, I also feel that it helps understand, you know, why we create what we create um, and what our background is. I studied at Pukihiu, like Gabi mentioned, um, and I did graphic design. I love this photo because you can see how much nature there is. Um, and obviously living in New York, we face a lot of um, weather differences. Um, and obviously that impacts me as an artist. <laughs> Um, so with graphic design, um, a lot of it went to went into um, mass production and sending things over to factories, understanding how things work um, in multiple quantities. Um, I always loved a lot illustrating, drawing. So my whole graphic design was based um, on trying to incorporate both illustration and design together. Um, so it's been a lot about process um, and a lot about illustrations, overly detailed illustrations were, were how I mainly started. Um, one of the classes we had in undergrad was uh, metal etching and other printmaking methods. Um, and while I was um, just after Pukie, um, I started working at Fahmim, which is um, a big uh, fashion brand in Brazil. They have a couple stores um, in the US too, but it was mostly about making prints and patterns. And then again, we go back into um, the mass industry, the factories, um, having things made over and over again. Um, so yeah, and everything very much based on drawing. So starting from a very raw um, way and then going into the digital world, just to make sure that you could send this to the production places. And then with metal etching, so I'll start going into process a bit. Um, one of the pieces I had, which was um, a challenge was making a big metal etching. And this was a huge leaf with um, a lot of engraved Rio fauna and flora. And I had 10 copies that I made right before I handed in the plate. I had to hand in the plate. so. Yeah, before, before doing that, I just wanted to keep a couple for myself. And just to show, because a lot of what I'll be showing is just about process, just to link how design and art are so tied together for me. Design is almost um, a base, a ground for me to actually create art, because I, I tend to use a lot of the techniques or just the knowledge or logic to actually make things possible and how I envision them. So this is just a little step-by-step step of just getting to this 
to the phase where I can actually start drawing on the plate. So we, we have a rectangular metal sheet, cut it up, send it down, wash it to take out the fat, and then we start drawing. Um, I moved to New York right after that piece. I'm trying to make a timeline, um, but still in New York, I was very much doing detailed work, very detailed work and always for my process. Um, so for example, for the, doing these heads, before I did the heads, I sculpted them out. So I had something to, to, to see before actually drawing. So everything has been much, much about process. Um, and there used to be a lot of reasoning behind everything. This was during my master's here um, in New York and everything had a lot and a lot of depth. And then, and then a bit of lithography. This is again, just to show process after process and how that impacts me and how I feel that I need to have a certain process to everything I do. Um, and then, yeah, so, this is how I ended up getting to where I am today with ceramics because I haven't shown any ceramics up until now. Um, so basically that was it. Just everything was very much 2D. Everything was printed. I was very used to that. That was very much design. You print on stuff. You think about how it can be commercial. And then being a bit, um, I, I would say fatigued by it. I started doing 3D things, which is when I started my thesis at the masters and I started using clay. So my first works were very illustrative, very figurative. Um, and then, yeah, I just kept on doing and doing, building and building. My, my goal was to have a full target shelf worth of products, packagings just related to food and how that would show a bit of the two different cultures, Brazil and the US and how that, that reflects a bit on society. Um, so I'll, I'll just keep moving along, but... Um, in terms of trajectory, so now I'm in the 3D world. And the super cool thing that came up was a music video that was completely animated and it was during quarantine. So we really could not see other artists or other people. So everything needed to be done within a, a single space. So then animation, out of paper, out of cloth, out of thread, whatever you could find around the house. And yeah, just some background scenes. Um, so then again, knowing about design, knowing about photos, knowing about how to project things and just basically understanding how a stop motion works or how an image to image animation works, that all just helped a lot to make things happen. And for me, it's all about the craft as well. So each of these things were made by hand. Each of these things were thought about how to make. And that always just part of the final piece itself. And it can't, I can't think of it as two separate things, at least coming from the perspective of creating. Um, and then back to clay. So after having that kind of set scenario, I started inco incorporating it into the photographs of my clay pieces um, and it just kept on going. And then just to finish off and then I have a bunch of process pictures, which I can go quickly, but um, clay was all about a very intimate relationship with basically mud, all different types of mud from very pure to just full of little speckles. Um, and it's, again, it's about process. It's very different from design, uh, completely different, not digital at all, but in the sense that you do have to think about it's, it's a 3D project. So you do have to think about all the angles, how things work together, what's the hierarchy of information. At least for me, that's how I view it. And so it was such an intimate relationship and I, I couldn't really force things to happen. They kind of just happened because you can't expect um, things to work out 100% with clay. You can predict, but you can't confirm. And so just because of that, the more I, I did uh, work with clay, the more I felt that things were being born out of nowhere. And the more I got that feeling, the more things started to need to have faces, almost as if they were talking back to me um, while I was creating them. So with clay, it's all about just creating a magical world, um, a lot of magical realism and the fact that, you know, it's our ordinary life, but we have all of these little things that we don't look in our everyday 
just everyday kind of work or routine. And then just trying to make this moment magical, I think, especially with quarantine. Um, my idea was to make a little bit of my house just as an oasis or at least a fairy tale I would love to live in. And so my pieces, they tend to be colorful. They need to be colorful. Um, and yeah, they they bring a lot of craft into them because it, it's a lot about technique in a way to make it work in the end. Um, but yeah, I'm just gonna show a couple of process pictures, making a stool, um, making the eggs. Because I feel that when people see the final things, they don't really, they can't really see the whole process behind them and how it gets to be what it is. Again, just about intimacy with the, with the piece. I went for a week just to check on the piece because there was a crack building up. And it's about that. It's about being there 100% of the time, dedicating yourself to it. Um, and yeah, kind of like an art of labor. Um, yeah, uh, just showing process and process pictures. Things don't always turn out as I wish. This was a broken prone. I put some base onto it to see if it would stick and the glaze just lifted it up and that's how it ended up being. <laughs> again, this was a broken piece, did not survive the kiln, broke again, but it's okay. And then this is just a final piece to show. Um, there's just so much more that goes inside a piece than you can imagine. And yeah, I, I feel that that's where design helps me a lot. It gives me a lot of, of the logical, um, reasoning I have to have behind to make things work. Yeah, final piece. And that's it, woo! <laughs> Let me stop sharing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Cecilia. Thank you for showing us your, your work. Sharing, can I ask you to, to share yours, please? Sorry, I was uh, on mute. Um, I just want to say that in my presentation, uh, I try to relate to the subject of the fine line. I mean, in first line, the, the word line is very precious for me because I use lines a lot. And also the word fine. I mean, we think about it as a, a thin line, but it's not only a thin line, it's also a finesse line. And, uh, and in each, in each field, the line should be, you know, for example, uh, when you, you're doing some uh, decorative work or, uh, or, or some designs, the line probably should be beautiful and, and uh, clear and so on. But in art, sometimes <laughs> the line, the beautiful line, the fine line is a line which is, you know, kind of wo wobbly and not unclear. And, uh, and so on. So it's really, I tried in my presentation to relate to the subject. I just want to say that, yes, I did study graphic design in Bezalel. It's an art academy in Israel uh, for four years. Uh, but during my time, of, of, of my time being student, I started to work at the J Jerusalem Print Workshop. It's a workshop and um, actually, I, uh, very soon I became a master printer in etching. And then until today, I'm connected to this subject. Uh, I used to work there for 20 years. And then, uh, but more important is the fact that uh, everything that I'm doing, even making sandwiches has to do with printmaking for me. Because printmaking for me is not just a, a craft or just a, a kind of a design or even not just a visual, um, a visual, uh, artwork. For me, printmaking is a way of thinking. Uh, and, and that's what I want to show you uh, very briefly. I'll try to do it very brief. Uh, so here I share. Yeah. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, the fine line. Uh, what, what you see here is really, I consider it as a drawing, but it's done out of metal. Uh, rods uh, that used for building, um, but and they are qu uh, quite big. But for me, it's a it's a drawing, yeah. The actual metal and also the shadow, 
and what happens uh, between the layers. Uh, so first of all, I want just to make a common base and to say that uh, the revolution of printmaking was immersed. Uh, and it helped to spread information. You know, if we think about Gutenberg, to spread information all over the world, but not, not only for people who can read, also for people who can just look at photographs and uh, at prints and understand. So the printmaking has a, a very important uh, role in spreading information, visual information. And here you could you could measure you could measure the artwork as a, a, as how the design is exact or comprehensible or uh, just so everybody will be able to understand here you can see about human being this is very nice and of course we're looking at it today and it's uh, we take it differently from the people who lived then at the, at the 16th century but that was the only way uh, uh, to spread information but then what happened the photography no i just want to say but not always it was a matter of uh, spreading information or doing the best craft because here we can see a work of Dürer. Uh, we're talking again uh, about the 16th century uh, was a, a perfect craftsman i mean he, he was uh, tutored in his father's uh, workshop and uh, and some of the work he did himself and some of the work he gave to other people to create for him but look at this artwork so amazing artwork so so when the artist was a good artist he knew what to do with this with this craftsmanship, yeah, with this uh, medium. And it's very important. And then, of course, came the photography. And suddenly, uh, the role of printmaking could change, uh, could change his aim. I mean, no more you had to uh, uh, draw or, or make prints of flowers, you could just take a photograph. No more you had to make a, um, um, sorry, to, to put images of prints inside newspapers or leaflets, you could just take a, a photograph and uh, put it in the newspaper. No more, you didn't have to uh, paint or make uh, uh, prints of, of uh, portraits of important people. You, can, you could just take a photograph and, and then you can keep it forever. So that's uh, something very important. And it freed all this craftsmanship uh, from the functional uh, uh, role of it. And here you can see a print that I really, really like. Uh, it's, uh, it's from a, a manual book about how to make uh, printmaking. And look at this character. This character is actually working. Uh, he is a craftsmanship. And look how similar this he is similar to my face, you can see. And I really identified with this uh, fellow because when I was working at the print workshop, I was a hard worker. I really worked like that. But I also was freed from the uh, functional part of, uh, you know, as, as uh, many people in the last uh, three centuries or, uh, or two centuries, and I could do my own art. Uh, and I really like this person. You can see that I, I identified with him and I did for some times. I really identify. I I really adapted this uh, his image, and it became my self portrait. Or here, you can see it's the low. It's the uh, it's a, it's a huge painting I did uh, lately, and I, I'm really using the uh, the lower part of the printer here, and and for me and f and that's how you see printmaking became sometimes the subject of my artwork. Sometimes. I'm thinking about methods and, uh, for example, all this, um, um, all this thing about layers, which is very, very common in printmaking. I'm using it a lot with my artwork and uh, not, to, not to speak about lines. I mean, and uh, cross hatching, if you know what cross hatching is, it's a, an old technique of how to uh, make shadows with lines. So I'm, I'm using them a lot of course, in a different way, in a contemporary uh, way. But here you see, the, those are my first 
some of my first uh, prints I did when I graduated from Bezalel. So you can see that I'm not a, a graphic designer anymore. <laughs> I'm an artist. Uh, and, and, and from now on, I think you can see um, the design and you can see the craft, craftsmanship in my artwork. And I consider myself as an, art, as an artist. And I also can say that I'm a very bad designer. Yeah, I try to work in uh, some offices and I'm not good in that. I'm much better in, in the art world. So here you can see some more prints, huge one. This is really huge. Uh, and also this kind, here you can see that I combined the etching and silk screen and color for the first time. And everything is about line here and about the surface, which is more like uh, areas, surfaces that are uh, uh, that, that kind of carry the line on top of them. And this, some, this is something that I also do with my painting. Again, you can see another print questions like what the different what are the differences when a line stop being a line and starting to be a stain yeah questions like that i mean i'm all the time i'm thinking about uh, about lines and about uh, philosoph philosophical question about a line because you know in the world there are no lines in the end line in the world is the place meeting between two surfaces so i'm thinking a lot about that and everything is really coming from the uh, from the uh, printmaking. Here, a, another example of a, of print. I mean, it's an exhibition I did in the Jerusalem Print Workshop two years ago, and it's a, an installation. It was a huge exhibition, and I don't have time to show everything. But you can see, for example, the the big uh, drawing on the wall. Uh, it's really a huge drawing, and I did it with uh, uh, with oil paint. But but you can you can see the why it why it is connected to to print and also you can see the mirroring on the left side you can see that I I made a, a drawing on the ceiling here and by the way it was done in a traditional way the way that the that Leonardo da Vinci that Michelangelo actually painted the the ceiling of the 16th uh, of the Sistine Chapel. Of this, yeah, and uh, there was a way how to how to uh, move the sketch to the wall. So it's exactly what I did here on the ceiling. But then there is this mirroring thing, which of course in printmaking all the time you need to learn how to see like a mirror, yeah. And actually, when you do many prints, in the end you do so, see it uh, upside down, right to the left, and so on, mirroring uh, the image. Uh, and also here, the Ole Gallery, uh, in the old Gallery, I had this uh, prints, which, uh, uh, which signed the directions, you know, the, uh, the east, west, north and south of the building. So you could walk all over the place and you, you could know all the time where you are. But at the same time, you can see it's written here in Arabic. And that's a, a, a worker. I see myself as a worker. And at the time when I worked at the print workshop, uh, they uh, renovated the workshop. So I felt, you know, they, they are workers and I'm a worker. And I asked the guy to write in Arabic. Uh, and then I added myself, but you can, I mean, only the Hebrew reader can, uh, can see that it's, it's the opposite. I mean, you can read it uh, like in English, but in but in Hebrew and Arabic, it's the opposite. Yeah, so so this is something again. It's a uh, again, it's a kind of a very important principle in printmaking that has an that has another meaning that can expand the meaning. Then you can think about it and work with it and so on. Also, I just want to say that the plates, the round plates, I just bought them in a shop uh, that make. Uh, signs, road signs. So again, the prints and the signs and and the information and the artwork. So all the time I'm playing with this, but no, and, and as you can see, not only technically, also uh, conceptually. Here is north and south. 
And then it affected my drawings as well. So I'll do it very quickly, but here you can see, I did it during one of the, the Lebanon war in Israel. I was very depressed and I, I was also in a very um, uh, bad situation personally, not only nationally, which you cannot separate, of course. And I was just sitting next to the table. I put my hand on top of some tubes and art uh, uh, materials, and I drew them for hours. So I have around 43 drawings like that. Now it belongs to the Tel Aviv Museum. But you can see how much the line is, a, is not an obvious thing. It's something that I'm thinking about. It's something, it's something with body. And also something about the materi materialistic uh, side of, uh, for example, the plates. You know, when we work in etching, we work with plates, but then metal plates. But then in the end, you get paper. And here, what I'm doing, I'm building uh, objects, which are, you know, three-dimensional objects and I draw them. And then the next step will be paintings, huge paintings. So you see how the line is, is changing all the time and how it has to do with my studio, everyday life, because you can see the tubes here. And actually what I do, I really, if you can see my studio, which it's just one month here and it's full of garbage and stuff and all this is like a, battlefield for me that I collect and, and I collect items and I draw them and then they can be objects, drawing or paintings. And here is another, those are two paintings that I did recently. And I think that uh, many people think that it's actually print, but it's not. <laughs> it's just a pencil and they're quite big. It's 150 by meter, I mean meter and a half by meter. And I did them uh, during the pandemic at my daughter's room. Um, and here again about the um, the fact this this is another work. It's a huge one. It's made out of seven uh, different uh, canvases. And all the time I was asking asking myself, is it one artwork or is this series of seven different uh, paintings? And, and, and again, here comes, I think, the question about series and editions, which I'm very much uh, um, thinking of. Uh, and what happened with this painting is that I didn't know really if it's uh, seven different ones or just one. So what happened during the process, I was working on one and then I hang, hanged it back on the, you know, in the installation. And then I saw that the fact that I changed this one affected the old painting. So I had to change the old painting. But then again, I had to go back to, to the individual, individual uh, um, canvases. So in the end, it just evolved like that, you know, going back and forth, back and forth. And only when I hang this artwork at the gallery, I realized that it's one. Financially, it was also a question, you know? And, and again, it's... Uh, reaching the question of a uh, financial side of uh, printmaking. I think this is part of the, this is why there are not many galleries that deal with prints because it's, because there are editions and, and they are cheaper and they are not unique in a way, something to think about because it is unique for the artist or the artwork is unique. Uh, but here what happened is I knew that if I sell them like seven different uh, canvases, it will be easier to sell. But then again, I understood that the best situation for this painting is one, <laughs> and that's what it is. Um, and then again, uh, thoughts about collages, which I, which I think they are part of uh, printmaking. And what you can see here, it's a collage of uh, printed. Matters, matters. So you can see, for example, the moiré. Moiré is when a printed matter is sitting on another one, and then it make makes some. It makes impossible to see unclear view. So you can see it here. I cannot show with my arrow. I don't know why. And this led me to uh, to my uh, late exhibition paintings. 
Here you can see this is a painting, I call it lasso. And again, the lasso is a line, is a line that capture, you know, capture the image, capture thoughts, capture the, su the subject matter, uh, capture the layers here. Um, yeah, you can see, talking about layers, you can see here the layers, uh, how layered is, is the um, painting is. And, and, and uh, in printmaking, you have to work like that. Or well, this one that followed the, the collage stuff I showed you before. And it's a collage uh, of a drawing of mine, a drawing from a historic, prehistorical cave uh, engravings, uh, some gestures which are just uh, impulsive gestures of my body, of my hand, and all together uh, create something. <laughs> and you can see that there are so many different kinds of line here. Um, the line for me is, <laughs> in a way, the line for me is a very, very wide, wild, uh, wide field with a lot of depth and a lot of connections to history, um, to, uh, to mental situation, to printmaking, and so on. And this is the last uh, painting I, I want to show you. It's uh, many people are asking me, is it a print? But no, it's not a print. It's oil paint. And you can see the the line here is really kind of smearing around, or there is like a cloud around the line. Something very typical for we call it dry point in uh, printmaking. It's when the line is not clear, is not fine, is you know, is like um, I don't know, is a bit dirty, like chuck, uh, yeah, a bit dirty. And so this artwork called Escalation, and I think I'll finish with that. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Um, well, I think uh, I have to stop. Uh, wait, 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 wait. I have a problem here. Can you can you stop me from sharing? Let's see. I think I can. okay. Yes, I can. Good. Okay, thank you. No problem. Um, so thank you both for for sharing your your works and for for talking a bit about your your practice and your your areas of focus. Um, before we start the debating line, and, and thank you, Sharon, for, for actually posing the, the, the matter of the finesse. And I think this is very important, especially because we're talking in a perspective of the fine arts. So um, arts being the discipline within the whole range of arts, there's theater, there's dance, there's cinema, there's music, and then there's the fine arts. And um, but before we get into that, um, I do want to, to talk a bit about your practice since we've, we're very fresh on, on the subject. And I think something which is very interesting about you, Sharon, is that your practice is, is based on uh, what in Portuguese we say matriz. Matriz, it can, also, it can mean headquarters or it can mean mold. And when you have a mold or when you have a stamp, you're always like basing your practice on that specific mold, which is always being mirrored. Like you said, like the, the, the practice of printmaking is about mirroring an image and having to think about it in an opposite way and having to think about it again and again and again. So it's like in reinterpretations of a previous mold, which may be the, the printmaking practice, may be inspirations you see from, from, from art history or your own daily life. And what I also think is interesting is since you have a practice of printmaking, maybe you have started seeing the world through lines. Mm -hmm. And I think this, this is an interesting way of how art is also very autobiographical. And so the, the whole identity of your work is about kind of like the imprint of your experience and also your practice. So once again, it's about the design or the craft aspect, having a, 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 a not only an aesthetic, but, but uh, um, a way of dealing with the content you're, you're, you're exploring. And I also think this makes an interesting parallel to Cecilia because um, 
even though her works are are um, the recreation of sometimes her imagination and making things out of clay, it's also a bit about mapping a, a, an identity and a, a sort of branding of what it is to be Carioca. And this is very relevant of how um, people may think, people from abroad may think that the, the Christ, the Redeemer, is Rio de Janeiro's icon. But for, for Carioca's daily lives, it is the, the global uh, package. It is the beach package. It is these, these objects and these food, the foods, the, 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 the cream, like the, the hydrating cream. And this really, really makes part of what a Carioca is in the most uh, jovial light, um, serene and happy sense, which is not really the case in Carioca's life, but this is what we want to be seen to the world. It's very tough, politically speaking, socially speaking, in terms of security, I mean, that's, but in a way for, for Cecilia to depict um, these items, these objects, especially through clay, like a very uh, delicate material, um, a material which which needs to be worked and reworked. It's it's about uh, trying to to bring forth this identity, this graphic design uh, branding sort of principle through um, through the industrial side of, of Brazil, um, like Andy Warhol has done with uh, within pop and his objects. Uh, but in this material, which is very, very precise and has a bit of a nature of its own, like, like Cecilia has stated. So I, I and once again, like bringing uh, the practice, the, 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 the craftsmanship, the material to light. Um, so thank you both for actually presenting your works. And I think this, this kickstarts our conversation very well. And um, and I think this, well, maybe I'll start by posing a question or by, by, by suggesting a question um, also based on the concept of the line which you brought forth, Sharon, which is um, there is a fine line and it's a, a, a line of finesse. It's a line of, of, it's an elaborate, it's a well thought, it's a highly posed line where art um, is set, but it's also a thin line. It's also something which it's almost missable of how thin it can actually be because we're always kind of dealing with this fluctuation and there isn't like a specific crossing line uh, or it, there isn't like a specific crossing point where, where this space actually uh, separates both or the three disciplines, uh, the third being craft. Um, so maybe what, what I would like to ask is um, how do you think art would distinguish itself from design? Is there such a question also that can be asked? Yeah. Um, I think uh, in, in that matter, I'm against lines. <laughs> I mean, I think uh, it shouldn't be a line. I'm, I'm for fluidity. Uh, and it really doesn't matter, you know, where, where at, at what moment or, or at what spot you are kind of crossing the line. It doesn't matter. It, it really doesn't matter. As long as um, as you know as you know what you are doing and you are not using the fluidity, if you understand what I'm saying, I mean this fluidity uh, is the best thing that happened to us, I think. And then you know I don't care what I am. I'm doing whatever I'm doing, and that's it. And uh, and it's good. And uh, and then there's all these uh, institutions that will uh, tell me you are that or not. But then I want to say that uh, this fluidity can also uh, bring up um, people that very easily will, will call themselves uh, designers or artists just because of this uh, uh, possibility of moving from one to the other. 
So, so I think most of the people do know what they are <laughs> and it's not a question for them. So we are talking only about a, a small group that really, that the uh, principle of, of uh, um, design, for example, are very important for the, the work in art and vice versa. And then if it's a serious, if, it's, if they are serious, I mean, they won't think about what they are. They, they will do whatever they, they are doing <laughs> and it will function in the right institutions. That's what I'm saying. Of course, there is, there is a, you know, this point of a client when you work for a client, but you know, artists were working for clients always <laughs> in a way. It's, uh, it's very rare that uh, an artist is working and is not aiming his work to anybody. I mean, so, um, so I don't know, uh, I'm against lines. I'm not talking about the physical line. I mean, I'm, I'm against lines, but I'm also afraid that when there are no lines, then, then it's becoming too easy. The line is like uh, say, uh, keeping us from, I don't know, from, from easy identifi and identifications, I think. Um, actually, for us to continue, I, before our meeting, I ended up picking a few quotes by artists in general, you know, whether directors, film directors, or artists themselves, or writers, about what art is. And I think there, there are some interesting points. Each one has a different perspective. Some are about autobiographical points of view. Some are um, more philosophical about mimesis, imitation of life, beauty, etc. But I think this will give a, an interesting continuation to our conversation because I agree with you, uh, Sharon. I think that when there is no distinction whatsoever, then everything is just too easy. But maybe, um, but maybe what I want to figure out is whether there is like a kind of also stereotype or a, a form of putting things in boxes that really says like, ah, well, you know what, what you're doing eh, shouldn't really be art. It should be more of a design or so on and so forth. So I, I am going to share my, my screen and, and um, let's see, can you, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. So this is our um, invitation. I decided to put it up because it's one of Cecilia's works. It's a, it's a drawing by her. And I really like how, well, this is a way where you can kind of pretend to be like listening to the phone. Uh, yeah, like you talk on one end and another person when the line is straight can hear it on the other. It, it used to be a game we played a lot as kids. And, um, but the line is bundled up so you can't really have the communication. And when the line is bundled up, um, it just loses its meaning and it becomes an act, simply uh, an object, not uh, a means of communication, not uh, a game. It's just as is. So I thought this was interesting because it's about the conversation, it's about talking and mm. I mean. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm going to show these few quotes and I think maybe we can try to start to understand or to try to draw out what being an artist actually means and, and maybe like where we, where maybe like some of it, some of the practice have been misinterpreted or, or Miss uh, explored. Um, so this one is from the Oxford English Dictionary uh, from the 1300s, and it says that art is skill. It is display. It's display, application, or expression. The expression or application of creative skill and imagination, typically in a visual form such as painting, drawing, or sculpture. So henceforth, as per the English. Uh, Oxford English Dictionary, uh, printmaking or ceramics is not a form of art, unless it's in, within sculpture. Um, producing works to be appreciated primarily for their beauty or emotional power. Um, then we have a few um, 
um, artist who, who mentioned, and I, I really like this one. And he says, a craftsman knows what he wants to make before he makes it. Uh, making the work of art is a strange and a risky business in which the maker never knows quite what he is making until he makes it. That is great. Yeah. Um, so Lewis, for example, he says, ideas alone can be works of art. All ideas need not to be made physical. A work of art may be understood as a conductor from the artist's mind to viewers, but it may, leave, it may never reach the viewer or it may never leave the artist's mind. This is also a very interesting question about authorship and how the work of art is perceived. Because in a matter of design, when you have a finality and when you have a, a, a goal, your work has to be perceived by the viewer. Whereas in the art, it may never leave the realm of, of the artist. It may or it may not, but it will also be dependent on how the viewer can actually perceive that work and how they can actually uh, um, reflect their own perceptions of life, their own understandings of, of, of the, 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 the task in hand um, on, on, on the work of art. And these two are, I think, are very good. Um, Federico Fellini says, all art is autobiographical, so all art is part of yourself, or is like a sun. And the pearl, of, the pearl is the oyster's autobiography. <laughs> and Edvard Munch, in a bit of a more depressing way, is, says, what is art? Art grows out of grief and joy, but mainly grief. It's born of people's lives. <laughs> um, and to conclude, I brought uh, Hockney, because, well, he's fantastic. And he says, art has to move you and design does not. Unless it's a good design for a bus. That is great. <laughs> that is great. So what, I, what, but what I'm trying to explore is like, should there be such a radical perspective on what design is uh, as opposed to, to, to art? And I suppose, uh, and I suppose there is the, the, the whole finesse aspect of, of, plastic arts which should start being broken down it should start to be revisited because maybe it shouldn't be something to be put on a pedestal mm -hmm. at least not not all the time because um, we can we can actually even go into matters of 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 value and and of accessibility and of reaching out to to a wider audience music theater um cinema they all do it really well but the fine arts uh are always trying to maintain exclusivity and uh, of being a very um brilliant purposeful um reinterpretation of life so i think and i think this dialogue of art and design or art against design it it also talks about this about this exclusivity and about this uh, as mighty as god position which which art pretends or intends or or um yeah or tries to be um so what what do you think uh, uh, should be the, the distinction? Like what what's like we've we've talked about how it is distinguished, but uh, and Sharon mentioned of what she believes that like there should be a distinction, but maybe like is there another way to to uh, to approach the institution of art, or or should it be reevaluated so we can? starts opening up to certain parts instead of other um, aspects of separation. I, I liked a lot what Sharon said that, you know, we can't make it easy also. So having no line would be, oh, you can do whatever you want and it's gonna be considered um, as like a high end thing. Um, but one of the things that I keep thinking, especially when obviously I'm always very divided between both, um, but I see design very much as a way to solve many problems um, that may be in communication, that may be um, in an actual act that is missing for certain people. Um, so I don't know, for me, design, it is about being beautiful. At the end of the day, it always has to be beautiful too. 
but for me particularly, it's about being efficient and tackling the task that it needs to, to tackle. Whereas art just comes a lot from the emotion um, and it doesn't particularly have a task to tackle, I would say. Um, I don't know, that gets to be a, a main point for me. Even, even when there is a lot of pro problem solving when making art, and that is in all types of art, I mean, things happen. Um, I feel that design is very dedicated to, to humans or, or to, to, to things that need solutions. Um, I don't know, that's one of my thoughts. Mm -hmm. I, and I actually think it's an interesting thought because there, to a certain point, um, like we were mentioning, or Monk, for example, mentions how art is about uh, an autobiographical uh, perspective. But when you were talk when you're talking about design, it's about the other. It's about yeah. a, a need. It's not about what you believe or what you experience or what you you see yourself as or yeah. I mean, um, so I think this is a very interesting matter and <laughs> almost a very egoistical matter in, in terms of art. But <laughs> art also tries to uh, uh, position itself in a way of exploring um, either political exploration or social exploration or, or, or historical exploration or, I mean, a, a psychological, whatever, like a very, very broad range of, of subjects to try to, to bring to light uh, um, issues and matters of our current uh, contemporary society mm -hmm. and where this, this, the, the artist is, is um, walking. So I think there's also this point of, of it being also biographical, but actually as an exploration to show the world what, what a new perspective needs to be. Mm -hmm. And if design is doing that, then what does it mean for art to look into design and vice versa? Yeah, uh, I can relate to, uh, first of all, I want to relate to this solving problem uh, thing. Sure. Uh, I, I think art is a big problem. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a big problem because it's something that uh, has to, I mean, it's, uh, we, cannot, we, we cannot live without art. But then we can. It's it's quite hard to define exactly. I mean, it's not. It's, you know, I mean, why we cannot live without art? But from the artist pers perspective, I can say that I have many pro uh, problems that I, I am solving during my my action of painting, for example. And and you know maybe I'm thinking about uh, when a designer knows that he solved the problem, and when an artist knows that he solved. The problem and I'm talking now about inner problems and I think that in art uh, the, the inner problems of, of, of the medium uh, connected very much with the problems outside I mean you can use the language of painting for example and you can uh, and you can uh, think about for example uh, light lightness darkness uh, composition, action, uh, uh, nets that sits one on top of the other, and so on. And I really, many times, I really like to put words into the uh, the act of painting, because many times, like like the artwork I showed you before, many times words when they describe artwork, they are very poetic, or if they are, yeah, they are very poetic. Mm -hmm. But then when they are coming out from the studio into the outside, everyday life, they became really violent. Like for example, this painting I showed you that's called Escalation. I mean, Escalation can be very poetic when you when you take the red and the black and so on, but in uh, Israeli uh, everyday life or Escalation has to do with violence. So, so I think, and, and that's, this is just an example how the problems that I'm trying to solve inside my artwork, uh, maybe all the time I'm, tr uh, I'm, I'm trying to see how I can glue them into the po political situation. Because as you 
as you must know, I'm we are artists are very aware and we, we do care about our, this world, about, but then again, you know, with art, you cannot eat. You cannot go to the grocery with art. I mean, I mean, it, it, so that's why art is a very problematic uh, and how art doesn't just reach uh, the elite. Yeah. So, of society. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a tough question. But I can say that when I have problems in my paintings, it can sometimes feel like the end. <laughs> like I'm <laughs> going to die. Like, I don't know, like, I don't know, like something which, and then again, when I solve them, if I solve them, it's, uh, it opens all new perspective of looking of, yeah. So I don't know, I think any creative person, even if he's writing stories or whatever, uh, know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, this thing of inspiration and it, it, it's the same with very good designers or writers or artists or chefs or whatever. Um, yeah, that's what I have to say about it. That's why, again, I don't like to draw lines. I love to draw lines on my canvases, <laughs> but I don't like to draw lines in life. Yeah. And, and another thing is that, uh, in a way, erasing lines is very much like drawing lines, in a way, oh. to make the line absent. I think it's, a, it's also an action. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And maybe I want to make a, a little parallel. Like we we have seen the world, especially through COVID, uh, react politically in many different fronts. We have seen people around the world uh, destroy or vandalize sculptures mm -hmm. because the people portrayed uh, were um, maybe not politically uh, associated with a, a right way of being. I'm going to try to say it as, as delicately as possible. And uh, I, I believe there's a, a beautiful sense of actually uh, um, trying to, to rewrite history and trying to, to uh, actually start to point out to the facts of what uh, should be like the, the future mm -hmm. uh, and not, I don't know, worship, for example, a, a slave's man like a slave owner, uh, maybe <laughs> worship a, a more uh, equal society. Mm -hmm. But in a way, of course, uh, uh, damaging the, the, the sculpture or, or, or destroying the sculpture is also erasing history. So it's a way to open up space to actually this forgetfulness uh, for history to repeat itself or, or for a new history to, to happen without prior knowledge of what has actually happened. And I think whenever we try uh, to restructure uh, um, a way of being of a certain thing, or at least redrawing lines or, or erasing lines as, as you post, um, it's a beautiful moment of trying to, to contemplate and trying to open up for new experiences and new perspectives, but at the same time, with a lot of care, so so things don't go back to a, a, a primal sense in the worst possible way. Mm -hmm. Also, it could be good, but it can also be bad. So mm -hmm. I think uh, like this is a discussion we're having because I believe, or at least in my point of view, um, the world is restructuring. It's trying to, to find its own place again. Like our society is trying to find its own place again in the world we're, we're seeing movements social movements that are actually going on in many many different countries it's not exclusive to like one specific culture and for us to want to redistinguish art from design of course as pretentious that it is from our parts but i mean we're just trying to open up the the, the conversation it's actually to 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 reconsider this configuration of of, of society mm -hmm. one of them specifically in our area of design and of art. 
Um, yeah, but you know, it's it's taking us back to the example I showed at the beginning about uh, about the print, the the, the the visual power of print, which is not art, but it is art. And then again, you ask yourself, are the sculptures, are, I mean, what was erased there? It, it's yeah. the icon. Yeah? yeah, the icon. It's uh, it's the craftsmanship. But inside this uh, sculpture, there is also artistic point, uh, artistic uh, values. So what they were trying. I mean, so many times in a, in one object we want to erase the iconic or the meaning, the political, the historical meaning of this object. But again, this object might have a lot of very, very important values that has to do with art. And I think it's going back to what I said at the beginning with the printmaking, mm -hmm. uh, with the fact that uh, a lot, most of the prints that we know today from the 16th, 17th, 15th, 16th century, they use, the, they were icons, they were expl explanatory images for the people. Yeah. But if you take it, if you take that from them, then you can see how beautiful they can be, how artistic they are. So I don't know. I don't know if I connected well to what you said, but I think, I think so. uh, but, totally. but it's all about the power of image, the power of yeah, image. Of course. And, yeah. and, and then the, the depth of the power of image. It, it's not only on the surface. It's not just to see. It's something to contemplate and it can go very, very deep. Yeah, no, while, while you were presenting, um, I was also thinking about at the time when printmaking was invented and it was the only way of spreading news around or communicating around, it is very much labeled as kind of like a method, right? It's, it's the way you can do things, you can get the word out. Um, and just, it's one of the things that I just find interesting is how history plays a lot of a part I feel in this line because the moment we start having more options you know to print and to spread things around I feel that um, older things obviously for being historical as well um, they gain a lot of value and they it's like you said like it's the power of the image because an etching is just so beautiful on its own it was the only way you could reproduce things but when you look at them right now at, in, in our time, they are just beautiful works of art by themselves. And it can be, like you said, just um, an informational botanical book. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I've been thinking about how it plays a part depending on when it's created and why it was created and how later on in the future, because there is so much that affects how it's read that it changes value and maybe it, it goes from being, I don't know, design to art or art to design. I don't know. I think you, you pose a, a very interesting matter in terms of, of um, historical uh, perception of, of what an element is or what, what art is. Uh, I want to open up the floor soon. Maybe we have a few questions from, from our audience, but just to, to um, comment on, on what you said, I think, I think it's really interesting how sometimes certain things also lose uh, certain values and gain others because of history. Um, while, while you were, you were speaking, I was also thinking about Sharon's um, uh, presentation and how she introduced Gutenberg. Gutenberg Im Im invented the, the press uh, in the Renaissance. Like before that, art and craft were actually mixed together. Artisan, artisans and artists were kind of mixed together. Like during the medieval period, it, it started separating, at least in, in uh, Western terms of, of art history. But um, when, when the re Renaissance comes along, it actually finally starts putting artists as artists, as their main practitioners. But still art was all, always being made for a purpose, for the purpose of decorating, for the purpose of illustrating a story. It was usually made through patronage. So once again, much like design of like someone asking for a painting to be made. Yeah. Um, so I think this is a very interesting element. And then jumping back to your, your 
your um, contemplation, Cecilia, I think uh, once, once you put that element through history, there is an impact of how it changes. Even though we try to speak of the work made for the Medicis during the Renaissance as a work that was made for the Medicis during the Renaissance, but it actually gains nowadays other concepts and other meanings because not only because of history, but because we now perceive art differently than they do. Yeah. yeah. So I think this is a very interesting point. And also uh, just to finalize, um, we were actually going to talk about the, the, the craft exhibition at the Whitney, yeah. but now I really want to point out Automania exhibition at, at the MoMA, like it, it's an exhibition of their collection of cars. And it's absolutely fantastic. I love seeing a neat type inside the MoMA. Yeah. Like I love seeing a beetle inside the MoMA. I think that was just fantastic. And, and why? Because it's simply beautiful design. It's a state of the art design, which can now be considered a work of value of, of contemplation. Mm -hmm. So can, point, uh... should, should we open up for questions? Um, does anyone have a question? Please unmute your your microphone and, and please welcome. Hi, thank you so much for this super interesting talk. I, I mean, I have a lot of thoughts and ruminations about everything that you addressed. But one thing that's been on my mind is the, 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 the idea of precision and whether precision and, I don't wanna say purpose or intent, but maybe it's precision and clarity whether that also comes into play in that fine line between art and design. So I'm throwing that out there just to get your thoughts. Cecilia, Sharon, would you like to, to address the question? Um. I'm, I'm thinking, because that, that's a great point. Maybe mm -hmm. I'll start. Um, I think when when I I think I'm I'm going to reply this when um, with with one of the quotes I, I showed. So uh, R. G. Collingwood he mentions how uh, a craftsman knows what he wants to make before he makes it, and the making a work of art is a strange and risky business of never knowing what quite he's what he will actually make. And I think about in, in terms of precision and clarity, um, from what I've understood, I think making art is about the process as well. It's, it's the exploration of the technique, it's the exploration of the theme, it's the exploration of the aesthetic, um, contemplation as well, like self-contemplation and, and, and aesthetic contemplation. And so, um, Difference from design, which I think like there is a lot of precision in what the aesthetic uh, has to be. So um, when you're testing out materials or when you're you're exploring, um, it has to be precise when you you try to show as much as you want from like your own perspective. But there is there is always the the elements of error or of testing and trying which will most of the times just uh, um, erase the, the preciseness of, of, yeah. of the question. Um, yeah, Sharon. Yeah, I, I, um, I think that uh, in art, good art, you must be very precise. <laughs> and, uh, and that's what's so beautiful about it because you know it's not mathematics. And, uh, and, and I think that's what I meant before when I said about solving, pro solving problems. I mean, uh, how, how can you know that that's, exact, that's the exact solution, right solution? How do you know that even if I'm talking, even if I'm thinking about uh, 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 expressive artwork, you know, how can it be precise? <laughs> but it can, that's, that's the point. And uh, I think it's a very good point. I think that's one, maybe it's one of, of the, maybe with this, we can really, uh, I think in, in design and in art, it's very, very different uh, to be precise. <laughs> but again, uh, 
it's a very good question. You know, I'm, I'm, many times I'm, I'm doing something, a painting, and somebody will tell me, ah, oh, it's nice, it's, it's okay, even I want to buy it, you know? <laughs> but I know that it's not precise. And I'm asking myself, why? I mean, and how do I know that when it is, it is? <laughs> and maybe the vagueness around, around this question is exactly what makes art, art. Because, uh, you know, for my students, I can explain everything. You know, I can tell them why this is good, not what the artist decided to do. But when I do my art myself, it's, I know when it's precise and I believe in preciseness. I think it's uh, good art cannot be with loose edges. Even if it just stains on the, on the, on the canvas. And, um, but when you are doing design, then you, again, you have the client, you have, you have uh, the field that you are working in, you have rulers and you have uh, 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 so on. Yeah. It's a very good question. And but the, my answer is you must be precise when you are an artist. The, this is my answer. And, I, and actually I want to leave it open because because that's that's all about art and the differences between artists and uh, genres and uh... and sorry just just before Cecilia adds to your point I, I also want to pose like as a follow-up when does an artist know when the work is finished because yeah. that is precision um, and sometimes it is and sometimes it's just a matter of intuition or Sometimes it's, it passes the point and then you just throw it away or you paint over it or whatever, like you keep on working yeah. until maybe you find something uh, new in it. But I think even the matter of like when a work is done is, is an interesting way of thinking precision. While in design, it's also, once again, as you mentioned about the, the client's needs and like what they, they think mm -hmm. is, is the, the, the final solution. But Cecilia, if you want to... So add your point, please do. Um, no, I'll, I'll connect both because I like what you said about intuition I and I was thinking about it while Sharon was answering. Um, it's because I feel that when you talk about precision, there is a lot of intuition involved. It's about the specific tone. It's about the specific little detail you added. So yeah, I feel that precision is a very broad um, range of things and it varies very much depending on what your goals are maybe i don't know i don't know but i i do feel that because it's like you said like when you're teaching you know exactly what to say to show your students that this is a good a good thing to do or this is what you should do this is what you shouldn't do um and it's all involved in the process but then when you're making your art yourself it's not like you're following those rules at all. It's it's just something that comes out naturally and it needs to come out that way. I don't know. That That's what I was thinking when you were answering. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Uh, but also we, we have to remember that there are very different kinds of practices in art. Yeah. I was talking about painting <laughs> and, you know, but when you talk about uh, video art or so on, it's very different because First of all, more people involved, and you have, and it's more like uh, uh, you have to calculate many things, and it should be very exact, and there are very rules. And I, I really was talking about painting, and I can share the experience I have here in my studio. I have this painting here, which I finished three times already, and it's not finished. <laughs> and I came this morning, and I said, "Shit, it's really, uh, it's not. I have to, you know." keep working and maybe to reorganize everything and maybe it will be something totally different. Mm -hmm. So why? I don't know, but I know. <laughs> yeah. just, Please, Cecilia, go. No, just, just to add um, one thing, because you said you finished it three times. Um, and one thing that I've always been struggling with with clay is that can't change it after you know the final fire that's it that's what you have mm -hmm. um, so I do think that at least with clay and how I've been dealing with it I need to be precise just just because I can't go back after a point mm -hmm. I don't know so yeah it, it, it varies now I guess mm -hmm. 
Well, um, I would like to invite anyone from the audience to ask a, a final question. Please feel free to, to join us. It's the same audience. It's the same audience, yeah. Or else um, I would like to, to invite you. Ah. <laughs> Yes, yes, please. No, I just made myself visible. No, no question. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, but I would like to maybe invite Sharon and Cecilia to make final considerations or, or, or even pose questions for, for us to leave here. Um, try to think, trying to think more about the, 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 the issue in hand, or I mean, continue this conversation or thoughts uh, after after we we stop the recording. <laughs> yeah, um, maybe maybe I can I can conclude saying that uh, in art we are work working with different media's and uh, and we have this perspective of history and uh, images and media's that uh, people were relating to uh, the 16th century, 18th century, 19th century, and today uh, are different. And when we look today uh, at artworks that were made uh, generations ago, we look at them differently from our point of view. And we can add to the images, we can add the values that we have today according to our experiences and uh, and i think it's very it's very it's beautiful and i think it can uh, it's has to do with imagination which always very important and with humor and and uh, and and then you can you can uh, bring up notions from ages ago bring them to our time and to give them new meaning and I'm saying all that uh, relating to this uh, craft uh, question and also about the future. I mean, I believe that in, uh, I don't know, in a few decades ahead, people will look at uh, this Zoom, for example, media as something naive, humoristic, uh, I don't know what, and maybe artists uh, would be able to use it for the artwork. <laughs> Lulu see, has, yeah, but she she she, but she's living now, yeah, and she's using it and relating to it with our values. But I don't know, two centuries ahead, I think they will look at us uh, from a different point of view, with other values and uh, and uh, advanced technique or I don't know what technology. I mean, that's what I wanted to say. Well, that's very interesting. <laughs> Cecilia, any <laughs> final points or considerations? Um, yeah, no, I, I mean, obviously I am struggling with all of this. Um, it's, I think my whole goal is to try and understand how I fit in here or there. Um, just one final thing, and I don't know if this will open up too much. If it does, we just cut it. Um, but because you were talking a lot about how art is a lot about the process, but how come that that is so conflicting to me and i do believe that it is it is all about the process but at the same time it's it's also all about the final image because that image is what defines if it's considered fine art or not um it's kind of as if there is yeah there's this encrusted kind of visual and necessity that I think people kind of base, you know, like, oh, this will, this is fine art. And they look at it or they say, no, this is not. Um, but at the same time, it is process. So, yeah, I mean, it's just all about understanding. I don't know how to define that line. Um, don't think there, it maybe is a line. I don't know. It's, yeah, it goes mm -hmm. here and there. <laughs> Yeah, maybe it's not all about the process, or maybe it is, but it's also all about intuition and all about self-conflicting issues and all about um, where it is positioned in history and how it is perceived by society and so on and so forth. So I think maybe like it's art is definitely 
maybe the hardest uh, elements to pinpoint to one specific way of acting. Uh, just like Sharon mentioned, just like a little uh, point, she was talking from a painter's perspective. It will change if you're a filmmaker, it will change if you work with performance, if you work with sculpture even. Like sometimes you have to, to consider like a, a, a very big uh, network of people to make an art work. So what is process in that sense? Maybe it's nothing. Like maybe the, the whole process is just like a simple drawing asking for, for the bronze uh, maker to, to pour the bronze over the cast that he made based on your drawing, so mm -hmm. on and so forth. So I think um, the beauty of art is exactly that there is a multiplicity of ways to see it. And, and there's a fluidity of ways to perceive it as well. And I think this is the most important element for us to, to remember. And as for its relation to design, I suppose, um, obviously craft is something that's extremely important. And I think people are only able to make what, what they, they understand or what, what, they, what they know <laughs> is real and, and how materials allow them to, to, to act with. Yeah. Um, but, um, and conceptually speaking as well, not only in terms of practicality, actually in both. Um, so uh, I think to summarize, it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing that art is so open. I do, however, agree that there are certain lines. There's a very, very fine art for the fine, a fine line for the fine art. But um, I suppose that's, that I believe would be my, my conclusion, uh, allowing people to perceive it in its all its multiple forms and, and ways of its own identity. Thank you, Gabi. Thank you, thank you so much, Sharon. Thank you so much, Cecilia. I hope- uh, our, our guests, thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, thank are you. you. It has been thank an amazing you. Thank you, are you. experience. Uh, and we'll see each other later. Yes. Thank yeah. you. Thank bye you. Bye bye. Bye.